All right, so let's uh, go ahead and start with round number one. I'm just going to go through the solutions uh, so you can, you know, see see how you did uh, and maybe see where you might have made some mistakes. Maybe maybe learn something too. All right, I'll go ahead and zoom in a little bit. Question number one, this is a three-pointer. The sum of two consecutive powers of two is 96. What is the sum of the two exponents? Well, sum of consecutive powers of two, okay? So power of two means two to some number. So two to the one, two to the two, two to the three. Those are all powers of two. And consecutive, consecutive powers of two means right, you know, in order next to each other. So two to the first and two to the second, those are consecutive. They come right after the other, one after the other. Two to the second and two to the third, those are consecutive. Two to the third and two to the fourth, those are consecutive. And what we want to do is we want to say, all right, let's find two in a row that add up to 96. So if we got two to the first is two, two to the second is four, two to the third is, let's see, eight, two to the fourth is 16. Okay, we're still not quite big enough yet. Two to the fifth is 32. To the sixth is 64. Okay, so look at this. We've got two to the fifth and two to the sixth. Those are uh, those are consecutive powers of two. Right, 32 and 64 add up to 96. And it says, what is the sum of the two exponents? Sum of the two exponents. We gotta to add together five and six. Just like that, 11. So if I were doing this problem, and remember you have a calculator on this, what I would do is I would just go through my powers of two uh, until, I, until I get to uh, two to the fifth and two to the sixth, and then just add those two up. That's a tricky one for sure. All right, let's try the four pointer. The equation, 31 minus 12x plus 8x minus 3 equals n minus 8 times 7 minus 3x plus 2x, uh, and it contains n a constant. So for what value of n does the equation have infinitely many solutions? Okay, well, infinitely many solutions happen when one side of our equation uh, is the exact same as the other. So when we're solving an equation, if we were to get down to something like you know, 3x plus 2 equals 3x plus 2, no matter what value I put in for x, it's always going to be the same, right? If I put in 2, I'd get 6 plus 2. On the right, I'd get 6 plus 2, 8 equals 8. If I put in 5, I'd get 15 plus 2 is 17. 15 plus 2 is 17. 17 equals 17. So all we're trying to do here is we're trying to say, all right, what number do I put in right here that would make both sides exactly the same? So the way I would do this, I would write it out as 31 minus 12x plus 8x minus three. I don't know if I'm going to run out of room. Let me start a little bit further to the left here. 31 minus 12x plus 8x minus three equals n minus eight. Seven minus three x yeah, plus two x. So this, this looks a little intimidating at first, but I just realized, oh, I can combine some like terms. We got negative 12x and 8x. 
it's going to be minus 4x, 31, and negative 3. That's going to be 28 minus 4x. All right, let's combine some like terms over here. This is going to be negative 3 and 2x. Can't combine anything in here. So I have minus 8 times, let's see, negative 3x and positive 2x. That is just x, one, negative, negative 1x. All right, well now, you know, I'm kind of, I'm getting, getting close. Uh, I'm not quite there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, okay, well, I see that 28 and negative 4x both have a 4 in common. So I'm going to just factor out a 4. I think this comes up in 7th grade factoring, but I'm not sure if I remember correctly. Uh, so 4 times 7 minus x equals 10 minus 8 times 7 minus x. Oh, look, this part right here is the same. So we got to say, right, in order to get both of those equal, both sides equal, this part right here, 4, and n minus 28, those both have to be the same thing. What would we have to put in for n to make this guy right here 4? Well, if we put in 12, I'd end up with 4 times 7 minus x over here. Over here, I would end up with 12 minus 8 times 7 minus x. I'll just rewrite this up here. Okay. Well, what's 12 minus 8? No, that's 4. So what did we what number did we put in for n? We put in 12. So that one you just have to remember. What is how do you how do you find infinitely many solutions? What does that represent? You gotta know a little bit of factoring from seventh grade, and then you just gotta be able to say, all right, well, what do I what am I gonna put in for? for n to make that uh, equal to 4. All right. And let's try out our last one here, our five-pointer. This, uh, this is an interesting one here. So we've got if a star b equals b minus a squared and a hashtag b equals the b root of a, find the value of 3 star a, or 3 asterisk a, hashtag 3. Fully simplify your answer. OK, so this one, we have to, uh, we have to use a little bit of arithmetic. OK, so this says a asterisk b equals b square, uh, b minus a squared. So this just means the first number that appears is going to be a. The second number that appears is going to be b. Okay? Those are just kind of placeholders. So let's look at our, let's look at our uh, expression right here. I've got 3 star 1, or 3 asterisk 1. So there's a, there's b. And it says a star b equals b minus a squared. So what's b? Well, it's 1. Minus a squared. Well, what's a? a is 3. I just, I just filled it in. This is, this is called a star operation problem. And they tend to come up in the very first math meet of the year at, at the high school level. They're usually a little bit, um, a little bit more in depth than this one, but this is a five pointer for us, uh, so it's a little trickier. Okay, so let's figure out well, what's one minus three squared. 
3 squared is just 9. 1 minus 9, that's negative 8. Okay. So now, 3 star 1, we just, found, we just figured that out. We did what was in parentheses first. That's negative 8. And now we have negative 8 hashtag 3 or hash 3. Well, this says a hash b is the same as the b root of a. All right. So our first number is a. That's negative 8. Our second number is b. So the b root of a, well, the b root, that's 3. So it's going to be the cube root, the third root. And a is just negative 8. This is where we say to ourselves, all right, what's the cube root of negative 8? Well, what number times itself 3 times equals negative 8? It's negative 2. Negative 2 times negative 2 is positive 4 times another negative 2 is negative 8. So the answer to our five-pointer is negative 2. All right, we are on to round number two. A big circle has a radius four times larger than that of a smaller circle. How many times larger is the first circle than the second circle in terms of area? Okay, so we're dealing with circles here. And it says big circle and a smaller circle. So I'm going to just go ahead and draw a little rough sketch there. There's my big circle. There's my small circle. And let's see. A big circle has a radius four times larger than that of a smaller circle. So the thing to keep in mind here is it doesn't really matter what the specific uh, radius is for, for each one. It just matters that the bigger circle's radius is four times bigger than our smaller one. So I'm going to say I'm going to make the radius of my small circle one. Um, nice, nice simple number, easy to, easy to use. And remember, radius is our distance from our middle, our center of our circle, to the outside. Okay. So our big circle has a radius that is four times longer, so one times four. That's good old four. All right. So now we got to say, how many times larger is the first circle than the second circle in terms of area? In terms of area. Well, what's, how, do you, how do you find area of a circle? Well, the area of a circle is just pi times radius squared. Okay. So the area of our big circle here is going to be pi times 4 squared, or 16 pi. And 4 times 4, 4 squared is just 4 times 4. And then our smaller circle is going to be pi times 1 squared, or just 1 pi. Okay. Well, how many times bigger is 16 pi than 1 pi? Well, let's just do 16 pi divided by 1 pi. Pi divided by pi, let's cancel, that's just 1. And 16 divided by 1, that's just 16. So our big circle is 16 times bigger as, uh, as our radius increases our our area is going to be squared. Okay. So, yeah, 16 for our first one. That's a three-pointer. Let's check out our second one here. Find the area of the polygon found by the following four lines. Okay. So we got ourselves a nice little graph here. Help us out. And we're just going to go ahead and draw these lines in. So uh, with this, you just kind of have to remember your slope-intercept form, and 
your lines of, uh, for constants, okay? So y equals negative x plus five. You remember slope intercept form, y equals mx plus b, we got our slope and our y intercept, okay? So y equals negative x plus five. So we've got a y-intercept of five. Go ahead and put that on here. And you didn't have to use the uh, this graph right here. You could have drawn this on your paper. Oops. Let's scroll up a little bit. There's my y-intercept. Now, what is what is my slope? Well, negative x. That's just the same thing as negative 1x or negative 1 over 1x. That's what we're going to do. All right. Slope is rise over run, change in y over change in x. So we'll start at, start at 5. That's our y-intercept. Count down 1 and right one, just like that. That's our slope. Then what I'm going to do, let's see. So that's our first one. Y equals negative X plus five. Y equals four. Well, that is a straight line at Y equals four. In other words, no matter what the X value is, Y is always going to equal four. And we're going to put that right there. Similarly, Y equals one, we're gonna put that right there. Y is always equal to one, nice horizontal line there. And our Y axis, well, our Y axis is this uh, vertical line right in the middle. Okay. So now we gotta find area. We gotta find area of the polygon. Okay. So that would be this, Art right in here. You get a nice little trapezoid. So you actually have two options here. You can, because we've got some nice, uh, nice lines here that that directly, you know, split our squares into triangles. So I could just count out. I could just say one, two, three, four, five, six. And then I have, here's, here's another one right there, two halves, so that makes seven. And then right here, we have another one half. Okay. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and one half, or seven and five tenths, just like that. The other option, if you know the uh, formula for a trapezoid, that's going to be, uh, let's see, base 1 plus base 2 divided by 2 times height. So base 1, that's this, that's 1. Base 2 is four. We're going to divide that by two. We're going to multiply it by our height, which is one, two, three. Okay. So one plus four. One plus four is five. So five halves times three, which is going to get us 15 halves or seven and a half or seven and five tenths. All of those were acceptable answers. Um, and that is our area in square units. We already had the unit covered for us right there. Okay, and our five pointer here. This is a tough one. 
All right, our rectangle is divided evenly by two line segments. And our line segment AH equals three. Find the area of triangle AIJ. Okay. So we know this length right here, this whole thing is three, and it's cut evenly into three pieces. So three cut evenly into three pieces, all of these are gonna be one. So we basically have three squares. Okay, and we need to figure out the area of, let's see, A, I, J. So that's gonna be this, triangle right here. And we can find area of a triangle. Oops, wrong symbol there, in the, in the delta instead of the in A. So area of a triangle is going to be one half times base times height, or one half times base, times what we call altitude. And altitude for our triangle here would be our, our length from base to tip. So base to tip, making a right angle to our base. So that's why it's kind of outside our triangle. Okay, so it looks like we're going to have to use our altitude because we don't have a, an easy to see height here. So we'll go ahead and we'll use this one right here, this formula. And again, this is a five pointer, so this is going to be a little bit, a little bit tougher than some of the other ones. All right, so we're going to use one half times base times altitude. One half times base times altitude. And we actually have our altitude, right? We just found it, it's, it's one. It's just the length of this square right here goes from, goes from our base up to the top of our triangle. So our altitude is gonna be one. So now we just gotta figure out what's our base? What's, what's this right here? All right. So here's where we have to use our kind of spatial thinking skills a little bit. I've got a, I'm gonna switch color, so maybe it's a little easier to see. I've got a big rectangle, oops. A big rectangle here, big rectangle, just like that. And if I notice, right, if I'm going corner to corner of this nice rectangle, this point right here is gonna be the halfway, kind of the halfway point of this line. So in other words, this is gonna be one half. And this is gonna be one half, okay. And remember, our total height here is one. It's labeled right there. Okay, so we know definitely that this point is, is halfway between. If we could figure out this distance right here, we would know what our base is, okay? Well, look at this, we've got one, two, three squares. And we've got this line going through them. So our line, is going to hit one third of the way down, two thirds of the way down, 
and then three thirds of the way down because it's split. These are all just squares. You got a straight diagonal through there. Um, so this distance right here, it's one third. This is two thirds. This distance right here is one third. Again, that's because this is split into three pieces. So our distance is also split into three pieces. So we've got one half leading up to our line right here. We've got one third leading down to our line. And then we have the space that's our that's our base. So we gotta say, all right, let's go over, let's go over here. One third plus one half plus something. You know, we don't know what this is yet. Call it X equals one. And then it's just a just a matter of solving our equation here. All right, one third plus one half. Let's go ahead and combine those like terms. One third and one half. Well, one third is two sixths. Um, one half, that's going to be three sixths plus x equals one. All right, I've got you now five sixths plus x equals one. And if I subtract five x from both sides, sorry, if I subtract five sixths from each side, I get x equals one over six. Okay. That's our base. That's this length right here that I'm coloring. Well, for our final answer, our area is one half times our base times our altitude. So one half times one sixth times one. One over 12, 112, or 112 square units to be more specific, but we already have our units given to us so we can just type that number in. And that is a very tough problem. Um, that is very tough. So one. Okay, and that is it for round number two. All right, let's go ahead and do round number three. If Josiah's test score was in the 24th percentile out of a group of 300 people, how many people scored higher than Josiah? All right, so um, we are also given the note, assume the 24th percentile is closer to the bottom of the data than the top, okay? So if Josiah's test score was in the 24th percentile, and he's, and that's in the bottom, then that means if the top percentage is 100, and he was in the bottom 24, then 76% of people scored higher than him. But our question says, how many people? out of 300, okay? So we just have to say, all right, what's 76% of 300? Well, 76% is the same as 76 over 100, right? Per cent means per 100. There's 100 cents in a dollar, uh, 100 years in a century. So that's 76%. Uh, percent. We could also represent it as 76 hundredths like that, as a decimal. So 76% of 300, let's just do 76, uh, 76 hundredths times 300. And we're gonna get, let's see, I'll do that calculation real quick. Yes. 
228 people scored higher. All right, an elevator has a maximum capacity of 1,000 pounds. There are already four people in the elevator. Uh, they weigh 153 pounds, 177, 204, and 121. Three more people want to get in the elevator. What must the average, or the mean, weight of the three additional people be no greater than? Okay. So we need to, we kind of got to remember what our, what our mean is, right? So mean, that is when we add our data points together and divide by the number of data points. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, let's see, an elevator has a maximum capacity of 1,000 pounds, maximum. So whatever we have, it can't go over 1,000. It's got to be less than or equal to 1,000. And what has to be less than or equal to 1,000? Well, the total weight. So that's going to be 153 plus 177 plus 204 plus 121. I'm running out of room. And then three additional people that we don't know. So I'm going to say there's one person, two person, three person, three people. That's less than a thousand. Okay. But we actually, we actually don't know. We actually don't know uh, their individual weight. We just know that there's three of them together. So three times some weight. Okay. Let's go ahead. And this, this is all less than or equal to 1,000 because that's our maximum, that's our maximum weight. Let's combine these like terms. Go ahead and add them together. So we have 655 plus 3x is less than or equal to 1,000. So this is our, these are our original people. Those are our new people that we, we don't know the weight. We don't know the weight. All right, so let's go ahead and solve. and subtract 655 from both sides. I get 3x is less than or equal to. 345. So this is saying, okay, all together, those three people have to have a weight that's less than or equal to 345 altogether. But what is the, what is the, this is, this is looking for the average weight, the mean weight. And what's the mean? That's when we take our, again, we take our number of data points, we divide by that, right? So we would take our total weight. This is our total weight right here, right? Total weight. And we divide it by our number of data points, which is going to be three. 345. Right? That's our weight of three people. What's the average weight of one person? Well, we divide it by three. So the average weight is going to be 115. Okay. Let's go right on to our next one. So our actual answer we don't want to write it as an inequality. Just going to be 115. Our weights can't exceed that, our average weight. 
All right, question number three. A little tricky one here. In order to win a game in tennis, you have to have a lead of two points. You win by two. If you and your friend, uh, you and your opponent are tied, so you have to win two points in a row to win the game. What is the probability that you win the next two points? Or you and your opponent split the next two points, and then you win the two after that. We're going to assume that everybody's evenly matched. There's an equal chance of, of winning any points. And our answer is going to be a fraction. Okay. So this is another tough one. This is a five-pointer. All right. So we've got this or. We've got this or. That means we're going to add a couple probabilities together. Or means we're going to add. All right. So probability that I win the next two points. Well, I have a one half chance of winning the first first point, right? It's just like flipping a coin. One half chance of winning the first point. Then I have a one half chance of winning the second point. In order to find the, the probability of doing both in a row, I multiply these together. One half times one half is one fourth. So the probability of me winning two points in a row is one fourth. But that's just our first part, right? That's just our first part. And if you want to visualize this, right, here's, here's our starting point. I can win or lose the first point, then I can win or lose the second point after that. So how many paths can I take that would let me win, uh, that where I win both points? Well, there's one. There's no other ones. But how many total paths are there? Well, there's, oops, I'm going to color. There's one, two, three, four paths. Okay. All right, uh, and then the probability that you and your opponent split the next two points and you win the two after that. Uh, assume players are equally matched. Okay, so if we split the next two points, let's look at this probability here. So what are the chances that I split, that I split? So splitting just means I win. I either win the first one, lose the second one, win the second one, lose the first one, uh, win the second one, lose the first one. Okay. So let's, let's see how many paths there are. I've got, looks like I could win and lose, or I could lose and win. Mm -hmm. It's like okay. that's going to be, and then I have four total paths. So that's going to be two out of four to win or to, to split points, right? Uh, and then I win the two after that. Well, we already know the probability of winning two points in a row. It's one fourth. And since I'm doing these all in a row, I'm going to multiply them. So two out of four chance to split, one out of four to win two points in a row. Okay. So what's, what's two fourths times one fourth? Well, I just multiply straight across. I get two over 16. 2 over 16, I can reduce that. That's going to be 1 8. Okay, so our final, our final answer here is going to be 
So the probability that we win two points, that's one fourth, plus the probability that we split and then win the next two points after that, that's one eighth. So we're going to add one eighth. One fourth plus one eighth. Well, one fourth is the same as two eighths. And two eighths plus one eighth, one eighth is three eighths. So three out of eight chance that either I win the next two points or we split and then I win the two points after that. So this one, if you feel comfortable with factor trees, sorry, not factor trees, probability trees like this, which I believe is seventh grade closer to the end. Um, if you're comfortable with that or with compound probability, then this one um, may have been, you know, not, not too bad. All right, that is it for round number three. Okay, so we're going to do round number four, our final round. There are red and blue marbles in a bag. The ratio of red marbles to blue marbles is 20 to 1. If there are 1,260 total marbles, how many are blue? Okay, so I imagine some people may have looked at this and said, all right, well, there's 20 marbles, right, my red and blue. Um, so I'm going to just take 1,260 divided by 20, right? Because there's there's 20 marbles, 20 red marbles for every every one blue one. We'll just divide by 20. That's going to get you close, but it's not going to quite get you the right answer. And here's why. I'm going to draw a little diagram here. So I'm going to do instead of marbles, I'm going to do tallies, just because that's a little easier for me. Uh, red marbles to blue marbles is 20 to 1. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. There's 20. In blue, there's 1. So for every, every group of marbles in here, how many total do we have? If there's 20 red and one blue, I actually have 21 marbles. In other words, 20 out of 21 marbles are going to be red. One out of those 21 marbles is blue. So if one out of every, uh, if one out of every 21 marbles is blue, I can just take 1,012, sorry, 1,260, 1,260, divided by 21, not 20, and I get 60. I could also think about this as, okay, I have 1,260, uh, 1, one out of every 21 marbles is blue, multiply by 1 over 21. Dividing by 21 and multiplying by 1 over 21, that's the same thing. And I'll get 60. So 60 marbles in that group would be blue. All right, question number two. So Roberto eats pizza at a constant rate of three slices per minute. And pizzas are cooked at a constant rate of one-fourth of a pizza per minute. If all pizzas are cut into eight pizzas, uh, sorry, into eight pieces, and Roberto starts with three whole pizzas, how many minutes will it take before Roberto runs out of pizza completely? And we kind of have to assume that Roberto has been a bit of a bit of a goober and eating pizza super hot as soon as it's coming out, probably burning his mouth pretty badly, but you know, pizza's pizza, I suppose. All right, so let's let's set this up. So he eats pizza at a constant rate of three slices 
per minute. So I'm going to write this in terms of, I'm going to, I'm going to use slices. So let's see, he eats pizza. So he's, he's losing pizza. He's losing pizza. So we're going to say he loses three slices per minute. Negative three M just means every time my minutes go up by one, my number of pizza slices goes down by three. Okay. And pizzas are cooked at a constant rate, constant rate of one fourth of a pizza per minute. So they're being cooked. So we're gaining pizzas. We're gaining pizzas. We're going to add. Okay. One fourth of a pizza per minute. Okay. Well, how many how many slices is that? Because I I wrote this in terms of slices. How many slices is one fourth of a pizza? Well, let's think about it. Here's our pizza. And we know that our pizzas are cut into eight pieces. Just like that, cut into eight pieces. Okay, and it says he gets one, one fourth of a pizza. One fourth, so if we fill in one quarter of this pizza, how many slices is that? Well. It's just two slices. So we're going to say plus two, plus two M. Every minute he gains two slices. And these pizzas are being cooked pretty quick. All right. And our last important piece of information here is that he starts with three whole pizzas. Three whole pizzas. But we're not talking in terms of pizzas. We're talking in terms of slices. All right, so let's, let's put our pizza here. One pizza has eight slices. If I add another pizza, that's going to be 16 slices, right? another eight slices. And then I add a third pizza, it's going to be 24 slices. Eight pizzas, uh, sorry, eight slices times three pizzas is 24 slices of pizza. And that's not affected by any sort of time or anything like that. We just straight up have an extra 24 slices to start. I guess he's pretty hungry. All right, and how many minutes is it gonna take before he runs out completely? Well, how many pizzas does he have if he's run out? Zero. Okay. So he eats pizza. He loses pizza at a rate of three, uh, a loss of three slices per minute. Gains them back at two slices per minute. And he has 24 to start. And we're trying to figure out when is that going to get to zero. All right. Well, let's solve it out. Combine like terms. Negative 3m and 2m, that's, uh, that's just negative m. Let me switch my colors here. That's negative m plus 24 equals 0. And then I want my variable and my constant terms on opposite sides of my equal sign. So look at that, I have a minus m. I'll just add m to both sides. And I get 24 equals m, where m is our minutes, m is our minutes. So this means after 24 minutes, 24 minutes, Robert's going to have eaten all of his pizza. There's going to be no more left, and he's going to be pretty full, I would say. That's a lot of pizza. All right, and our final question of our final round. A car is traveling at a rate of 45 pi feet per second. If the radius of each tire is two feet, how many times will the tire rotate in three seconds? Okay. So I know that I'm going 
45 pi feet per one second. All right. The radius of each tire is two feet. Uh, how many times will a tire rotate? Okay. Well, what we have to figure out, what's, what's the distance of one rotation? Well, it's a circle. So our distance of our tires, one rotation is going to be just the same as our circumference. So this is where we have to kind of remember our remember circumference. That's going to be 2 pi times radius or pi times diameter. So again, circumference is the same as one rotation. One rotation. So I'm going to say, all right, well, I want to cancel out my feet. I'll cancel out my feet. So I can cancel out feet by let's uh, let's let's find our let's find our circumference here. So let's see. Each radius of each tire is two feet. Radius is two feet. So our circumference is going to equal two times pi times our radius. Radius is two. So it's going to be our circumference is four pi. All right. So then I've got my circumference of four pi and I know four pi uh, we're going to travel four pi feet every time we rotate once. So I have 45 feet, uh, 45 pi feet per second, and four pi feet in one rotation. Okay, well, I got to cancel out my feet. If I can somehow get feet divided by feet, I'll be good to go. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my 45 pi feet per second and I'm going to divide it. I'm going to divide it by my 4 pi feet per my one rotation. Just like that. How does that help me? Well, what's, what's dividing by a fraction the same as? Multiplying by its reciprocal. So instead of divided by four pi feet over one rotation, I'm going to say one rotation over four pi feet. Look at that. I've got feet over feet. It's going to cancel out. And let's go ahead and multiply across. So I've got 45 feet times one is just 45 pi rotations over one second times four pi. That's just four pi seconds. So 45 pi rotations per four pi seconds. I think we can simplify this a little bit. Pi divided by pi, that's, that's just one, right? Anything divided by itself is one. 45 divided by four. We got a calculator for that. We don't need that right now. 40 divided by four is 10. Five divided by four is gonna be, uh, let's see, one and 2,500. So this is uh, 11 and 25 hundredths rotations per one second. All right, so we've got 11 and 25 hundredths rotations per one second. We want to find how many times the tire is going to rotate in three seconds. So if we have one second, we're just going to go ahead and multiply this 
I3. Oops, that's a division sign. <laughs> And what are we going to get? 33 and 75 hundredths rotations. 33 and 75 hundredths rotations. We already have the unit right there. So uh, again, this is a this is another pretty tough one. You have to have uh, in this in this case, your science classes may have come in handy. We just took our 45 pi feet per second, divided it by our feet per, per rotation, right? So we could just get, well, how many rotations a second? And then we just multiplied by three. All right, and that is it. Thank you to everyone who participated. Hopefully you learned something. And uh, maybe I will see you next time at the next meet.